and welcome to this edition of BEP Talks. I have very exciting news for everybody today. A very simple message. There is nothing wrong with you. How great is that to know? There really is nothing wrong with you. And we have a fantastic expert today. She is a speaker, a transformational coach. Um, she does energy therapy. She has such wonderful, even clinical nursing background. So here to tell us that there's nothing wrong with us. Please welcome our guest today, Claire Unkafer. Hi, Hi Beth. Claire. Thanks for having me. So happy that you are here today. As I said, I'm so excited to have shared that message. There's nothing wrong with you. And I think that is news that we all kind of need to hear today. Yes, I think, it, and I realize that that might be a far jump for some people, especially if you're in the throes of not feeling good, but hear me out. It was really freeing as a clinical nurse and as someone who experienced depression and anxiety much of my adult life, I saw both sides, right? Um, there's absolutely a place and life-saving qualities to medication and talk therapy. However, for me, and like so many people that I talk to, it it's not enough. It's not really affecting real and lasting change. It's not helping enough. They're still struggling. And so it, there's more to it. And I went on that journey to find, because I was not going to accept that this is my fate take this medicine and cope and manage, do the best you can, good luck. And, um, you know, go talk to somebody once a week to vent and feel better. And what I discovered was that we, depression and anxiety are just symptoms. They're symptoms of the root cause of the real problem. And once you uncover that real problem, then everything changes. And what you realize is that nothing is wrong with you. You are the appropriate amount of sad for the sad things that have happened. You are the appropriate amount of angry for the way you've been treated. Things that have happened to you have left you traumatized, overwhelmed, frozen, not knowing what to do. You know, we all know we need to heal, but like how? Yeah, yeah. You know, it sounds like to me, Claire, this sounds like that four letter word called life. <laughs> right. right? It happens and it happens. So I have so many questions, but my gut feeling tells me this. You're going to give us a little bit of what you do when you talk to your audiences. I'm so excited. So rather than ask you the questions, I have a feeling that you're going to answer some of the questions that I already have yeah. in your talk. Otherwise, we're going to talk about that um, a little bit later. So can you share with us a, a version, like uh, um, when you're talking to an audience, when you're talking to your community, mm -hmm. can you share with us what it is that you tell them to explain? There's nothing wrong with you. Can you do that? Yes. So there are five kind of steps that okay, I cover. I'm going to step away. I'm going to step away. I'm going to give the stage totally to you. Okay. So I'm here to explain why there is nothing wrong with you. But if there's a little bit of something that she said that's appropriate, oh, yeah. Claire, she tell us it's normal and how to deal with it. So here is yeah. Claire Unkefer. So I, I'm thinking about a story of a little boy that I heard recently who experienced some trauma in his community, in his school, and even lost a, uh, a, a little boy that he knew. And he started experiencing um, what people call anxiety. He didn't want, feel like going and doing things. He pulled inwards. He was starting to act scared of the world. I was talking to this mom and appropriately, you know, out of concern, they took the little boy to a psychiatrist. They diagnosed him with an anxiety disorder, started him on medication and sent him to a therapist. And I couldn't help it. I just said, oh my goodness. And I, in my mind, I was thinking this little boy is going to go his whole adult life managing this anxiety disorder when what he's experienced and his response to it is appropriate. We just didn't know how to help him through it. And, and the root cause of anxiety and depression and all of that, and that's the first step, there's five steps. 
The root cause is understanding what is the real problem. Why am I feeling this way? And the key to that is it always comes down to a belief that you have formed about the world or about yourself or the world around you. And I told this mom, I said, you know, I haven't worked with, you know, this little boy, but um, your son, but I would guess that subconsciously, and that's where the answers are, is in the subconscious. And people get afraid of that word. But the fathers of psychotherapy, Carl Jung, Sigmund Freud, and many others were all about the subconscious. They knew that that's where the answers lie. They're within you. They're not buried. They're right there. And I told her, I said, I bet if I were to guess, and what do you think about this? He, he came to a conclusion based off of that experience that the world is not safe or bad things can happen at any time, or the world is scary, or whatever it was. But instead of helping this little boy maybe reframe, and, and it's not about invalidating, because absolutely that has been his experience, right? He just was a little boy going to school and something really bad happened. And so he's not making this up. It's not a false belief, but we need to help him with that. We need to validate him and acknowledge him and say, yes, oh my goodness, I, of course you feel that way. Of course you do. Look what happened. You know, but then he, the person or he needs to decide, do I want to continue to allow that to run everything? Or do I want to decide something different? Do I want to decide, you know, bad things do happen, but I won't be happy if I just pull in, or maybe I need to, what do I need? I need to pull in for a little while until I feel safer instead of just slapping a label on and that's all we know what to do. So for me, for my depression, the root cause that I discovered through subconscious work, which is not hard and not scary, it's actually freeing once you discover it, was I believed at a, the core level that I was not lovable. And in fact, that I was hard to love based on some things that happened to me. That's what I concluded. And so you can imagine how that affected everything around me. So that's the first step is uncovering the root cause of your issue. You know, and for 150 years, we've said, anxiety is bad. Anxiety is not bad. Anxiety is your body giving you a message, your body, your mind, giving you a message that there's a disturbance in the force. Something's off. Something's not in congruence with what you believe or what you want. And instead of tuning inwards, we've learned to um, manage this kind of baseline anxiety a fight really to know, I want it, you're, it wants to become conscious, but we want to stuff it down. So we stay busy. We keep our heads down. We don't turn and face it and be like, what, what do you have to tell me? And we're not taught how to get those answers, how to receive those answers. So the root cause is so important. Second, and I was surprised actually to find this out. And this is what I discovered when I started working with so many people. I knew I had struggled with it, but I didn't know it was such a prevalent problem, was allowing ourselves to be who we are, accepting ourselves. We have been rejected in a lot of ways, a lot of ways our whole lives. And so we have modified our behavior. We have made decisions to become an acceptable version of ourselves for other people, even people that really love us. The message is be you until it makes me uncomfortable or until it makes me disappointed. So it's not really be you. And so, so much unhappiness comes from that place of not feeling like you can be you in some way, shape or form it's always related to that. I'm not lovable. I'm not good enough. I don't matter. It's not okay to be me. You know, the me that is me is not acceptable um, here or welcome here. And so in so many ways, 
people in subtle and not subtle ways. I had a client who told me, you know, her mom said, she said, mom, I just really can't make it to this family gathering. I just can't. I just, I don't have it in me. You know, she had a lot going on. And her mom said, our relationship is going to change if you don't come. And so that, what is the message in that? I don't care how you feel. I care if you do what I want you to do and please me and accept me. And that's the message we are given from birth. We are conditioned to please others, to not disappoint people, to fit in. But we are individuals with quirks. And once we can truly learn to accept ourselves and give ourselves permission to act from and make decisions in alignment with that true self in a kind, direct, and honest way, and to not feel guilty about doing so, it's one thing to act in accordance with what we want, need, and wish, and desire, but when we are just going to feel guilt, it doesn't make it, that's not what I would call happy. So there's four steps to that, and I go over that, but that's that was a surprising revelation for me that I was like, oh my goodness, it's an epidemic. It's an epidemic that people don't feel, that they don't accept themselves even, but they don't feel like they can be themselves, express themselves, and do what they want and need if it upsets others. And so that was huge. And then step three is communication, learning simple communication skills that I call it argument-free communication. It kind of exposes our triggers, strips down the defenses and attacks and, and fosters real communication and understanding and what, again, right? What, what's really going on here? What are you really upset about? And it's usually not flattering or something we don't want to say out loud because it's an ugly truth. But once we can learn those skills and my husband and I committed to learning these skills, we kind of fumbled our way through it after a huge argument. We came together and we're like, what are we doing? We love each other. You know, we love each other and I love you and you love me and nobody's trying to take the other one out at the knees. So we've got to learn to do this differently. And so we became committed to it. And I found some specific things that, that will help you turn relationships around. And I'll give you one example now, learning the traps of an argument, the three traps of an argument. You can dissect any arguments that you witness or have and, and find these three components in them. And if you can switch out of this, then everything changes. So the first thing is defensiveness. You've said something and then the person gets defensive. It deflects responsibility from the self, themselves. This is all subconscious. They're not trying to do that, but they get defensive. I didn't do that. That's not what happened. Um, basically, you're wrong for feeling the way you feel or perceiving what you're perceiving. And then if that tactic doesn't work to get you to stand down, then they'll attack you. Well, you this, you that. And now it's on me. You know, we're not even talking about what I'm upset about anymore. Can we have a real conversation? Now I'm on defense. And that's what happens so often. And then if that tactic, and this is all subconscious, if that tactic doesn't work, then they go to extrapolation. They extrapolate you and your problem to 10 years ago, the way you are, your very being. And, you know, well, you always this, you always that. And last time this, and now we're not even, we're so far from the topic of the conversation that uh, it's like a, it's a subconscious tactic, you know, to keep me safe, to keep me from being attacked. I'm going to do these three things. I'm going to defend myself. I'm going to attack you back and I'm going to extrapolate the problem to deflect, deflect, deflect. And it's a safety mechanism that our mind, and if we're not aware and conscious and intentional, can take us down this, this rabbit hole. And so the way to just combat, combat that is to stay on topic calmly, directly, honestly, I was simply saying, and keep bringing the focus of the conversation back to the topic at hand. There's a lot of sub little rules to that. 
What if the other person stays triggered? What if it escalates and things like that? But just you can start noticing in, in an argument that you witness or have, hey, were those three components there? And once you know it, you, you, they're, um, they're like potholes that you avoid. Okay, we're not going there. We're not doing that. We're, we're sticking with the topic at hand. We're committed to understanding each other and finding a solution. And if things get too escalated, we know that's time to step away, take a breath, become gr- centered and grounded, and then we'll come back together. And it's a commitment you make with each other. The fourth thing is learning how to release uncomfortable emotions and interpret their message. So how to interpret the message if, you know, because we're human, being healed does not mean without problems or without feelings or without reactions. I still experience all the range of emotions, but I know what to do about it. If I'm angry at something, or I don't know what I'm angry about, or something's off, or grief. Man, we just don't know how to move through grief and and sadness and, and allow those to be for a hot minute and how to dissipate them, how to, how to extract any wisdom and guidance from that that's right for you and your life or what you need to know let it come to completion and then release it and move forward. People hold on to grief and sadness for years. And when they finally, and it's a short process, actually, I teach it to you. Um, It's 10 steps. It's really short. It takes a few minutes. Once you release that stored up emotion, that pent up emotion that's been, you've been holding for hours, days, weeks, months, years, it's freeing. You feel better. People say, I put down a heavy bag that I didn't know I was carrying. It's just, it feels better. And once you have that skill, and that's what I think it is, it's a skill. Then you utilize it to just keep moving through life, as you said, and so that you can be present, so that you can get the messages so you don't have to expend so much mental energy pushing things away, pushing feelings down, that you have the tools, you have the bravery to look at them, extract the message and move through them and be done with them so you can get on with your life. And then the fifth thing was learning how to reconcile, psychologists call it cognitive dissonance, which is inner conflict. So there's a part of me that this, but there's another part of me that that. And we live so much of our lives with this like split confliction. And and it kind of makes us feel bad about ourselves or wreaks havoc. And I'll give you a very practical example. And I talk about it a lot in some other interviews about motherhood. I have four kids about motherhood and postpartum depression. But there was always, my oldest is 18 now, there was always a part of me, of course, I love my children, they're wonderful, they're amazing, they're gifts from God, they're blessings, but there was always a part of me that secretly hated the work of motherhood. I I hated that I'd lost my freedom, my ability to care for myself, my free time, the connection with my husband had changed. There was all this kind of like resentment and I held it. And it just made me feel bad about myself. So when I was able to allow that part of me to have a voice, to be, to say what she needed to say, I was able to come to this place of acceptance, love, gratitude. I I was able to let her go, if you will. And almost instantly, I started enjoying the work of motherhood and, and really appreciating, I get to do this. This is so amazing. And so just the power in that, and it's, it's parts of us that are in confliction with our life, but it's also identities that we have that we don't want to have anymore. I don't want to be that person anymore, but I am. And just how to, I call it like shedding skins, how to do that. So you can feel like a different you, like the you that you deserve to feel like truly you. And it's actually like the true you. And it's so amazing um, to, to feel that way. So those are the five 
big things that I think in order to truly move past our issues, to discover the how, where, why, when we feel the way we feel, and to truly move through our lives and forward through our lives with more enjoyment, we need to really do that work. And it's, you know, it just takes commitment and awareness and intention. And I do it with a lot of humor. My husband and I do it together with a lot of humor. It doesn't have to be this ugly, ugly cry healing thing. Although there might be a few tears somewhere along the way, um, humor is very important. So those are the things that I help people with. And what questions do you have, Beth? Well, how much time do you have? I have some time. Well, I, I think this is like days and weeks and a lot. <laughs> oh my gosh, what you said is so, you know, you make it sound so simple. And maybe that's the whole thing is that it doesn't have to be hard. It is a lot more simple than you'd think. And and it's it's more of a realization, right? It's like that you you've gone through your life with these glasses on, and somebody says, "Hey, let's just take them off for a minute and look at what's really going on." Because the glasses are just making you miserable. <laughs> they're hiding a lot of stuff, but they're really like really not making your life wonderful. And yes, when they yes. do it, they experience this sense of freedom. And I had one client say, "It's like there's this secret door in the wall." the way out, but you never knew it was there until someone just said, there's the door. And then they're like, oh my God, of course there is. So it's it's really cool to see that the dawning of realization. Well, first of all, because you've experienced it yourself, you're yeah. not just talking textbook kind of, you know, psychology, you know, one over one, two, three, you, you know, you've experienced it yourself. And um so grateful that through your experience that you are now able to use that and and help so many other people. Like anything else, you use the word communication. And I think that that is the key, therefore often the problem, that we often overlook. Talk to people, share your feelings, tell them well, you said you have to discover the why. So maybe at that point, you don't really know the why. Well, you can just start by honestly communicating how you feel and you do it in a kind, direct, honest way. And the reason we don't do that is because often it's something someone doesn't want to hear, maybe. Yes. And, you know, I, I've said to my husband before, listen, I'm sorry this is inconvenient to hear or to know, but this is how I feel. And I just allow him a hot minute to digest that, you know, cause I'm not, I, I've discovered the cost of stuffing that down. The cost is resentment and anger and unhappiness and depression and anxiety. So I'm going to say it, I'm going to let you know, I'm going to communicate it to you, but I'm going to do it in a kind, honest, direct way. And how you respond is really not my responsibility because ultimately I'm taking care of myself, yes. you know, it depends on the relationship when it's, you know, when it's your partner, but you know, people have very complicated relationships with people in their family. And I've committed to communicating like this with them. And I'll have to be honest with you. Some relationships did not survive it. Some well, when didn't want you, to yeah. that honesty game. When you use the example of someone saying, you know, I just can't make it to the dinner and the mother kind of put that pressure on if you don't come, our relationship will be forever changed. It made me think, well, really, what was that relationship ever truly based on? Right. And and now that I'm trying to take care of myself, that makes me selfish and bad. And now I'm the bad daughter and the black sheep. And we believe it, but it's a lie. The, the, the lie is that we have to dim who we are and what we need to make other people happy at our expense. Yeah, and, and that's not healthy for anybody because then they're, everybody's living in a dishonest, faux kind of relationship. There's no, there's no pleasure, I don't think, in trying to please somebody else at the cost of your own happiness. Mm -hmm. um, and we can have compassion for what sure. they're trying to accomplish because they're, tr you know, they're trying to get us to fall in line, but they really just want us 
you know, the best, they do want the best for us. And it's, it's harder than you think. But once you decide to live that way, you know, I had this moment with my 18 year old son, he's becoming an adult and launching off into the world. And he, you know, is talking about his dreams and what he wants and what he sees for himself. And, and I had to catch myself and say, and I had this little, com I said, wait a second, Claire, if you want people to allow you to listen to yourself and act in alignment with what's best for you, you need to do the same for other people. Exactly. And exactly. what he's saying is, I want this. I need this. This is what feels right to me. So I am going to give him that gift of be you, honey, go for it. And I'm here for you always. And you should really, as a parent, really feel proud that you raised him to the point where he can discern what he believes is best for himself. Does it mean we're not going to all make mistakes? No. I want to make one point. We live in a world where everybody wants to win. Yeah. And I think with that, there's this knee-jerk reaction to blame. Everything is wrong because what you said, what you did, or what you didn't say, or what you didn't do. And am I right? Is everybody, is there a passive aggressive kind of thing here that everybody wants the other person? So, yes. And what you're talking about is victim mentality, which is totally normal and natural. But at the end of the day, you have to decide that you're not a victim anymore, that things have happened to you at, and maybe they were other people's fault, right? But it's not about blaming your mom. It's not about blaming your dad. It's about self-care now. It's about, right. I want to be happy. I want to feel good. And so I'm going to take responsibility for that because I'm the only one that can do that. Yeah. And so yeah. it, it really is handing over, you know, one of my teachers early on asked me, if I asked you to hand over your depression card, your depression ID card, what would that mean for you? If I, if you had it in your back pocket now and you took it out and handed it to me, would you willingly? And I, at first I was like, of course I would. That's a crazy question. But then I was like, wait a minute. One, that's who I am. I don't know who I am without that. And two, oh. like when she really made me look, I went, oh my goodness. It is my get out of jail free card. It is my, I don't have to deal with it. I'm too overwhelmed. And that was not flattering, right? And I didn't want, it's much easier to blame other people than to take responsibility for that. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. You made me who I am. And I guess in some way, culturally here in the United States, you know, you said it's not your mother's fault, although. The whole thing is always, oh, you know, my mother, my mother, you know, we always kind of um, go back to that. Um, well, and it, it's not that it, you formed interpretations, maybe have trauma from events that your mother inflicted on you. That's true. But um, it's, it, it happened to you and we, and there's, this is a two hour session yeah, <laughs> that yeah. we revisit all this and and heal it and turn it around for you but it becomes but now it's my job to do something about it and it's your right it's your right and it's your responsibility mm -hmm. everybody i think not everybody but so many people you did it to me now you clean up the mess you created this situation you clean it up and there's that that we use words like guilt and blame and resentment and conflict. And those are big, powerful words, but they're real. And if it's how you're feeling in that moment, it's real to you. Is it not? Those are true, real feelings. True, real feelings. And I'm not, I, I'm not a bypasser. We have, those are speed road, speed bumps that we halt and we look at and we deal with and we move through them because you can't move forward till you do. Right. But also if we're talking about mothers, she can't fix it because she probably hasn't healed her own stuff. And that's why the relationship is in such conflict. So you have to do it. And then guess what? When the generations move along, we, you know, we'll say, oh, God, I'm turning into my mother. I'm turning into my mother, you know, um, because it's what we know. It's what we've experienced. So I guess that's a natural thing. 
gosh, we could just keep talking about this. And, and there are different situations, different people that are coming into my mind about, ah, that's what's going on there. Uh, as I said, we all want to win. We want to blame. It's easier to do that. So words like depression, anxiety, trauma, these are symptoms, as you say. They are feelings. And those are, like you said, your card, your depression card. That's that's a sign to take action. It doesn't mean you just stop there because you're depressed. Well, why? Find out. Right. And I didn't know this, to be honest. Like, I didn't know there was another way. I had bought into the disease model um, until oh. I found my way out and was like, holy smokes, why doesn't everyone know about this? Why aren't we blasting it from the rooftops? Why aren't we telling people, hey, you can move through and pass things and reclaim that because the real wound is reclaiming self-love, self-acceptance, self-trust, all those things, all those selfies. And then you feel better. I remember the moment that I woke up and, you know, I had some dark moments throughout my life where I didn't want to live anymore. And there was, that was kind of always there a little bit, like, I don't want to be here was, you know, not like I want to go commit suicide. Although I've had those thoughts too. I've been low. So I get it. <laughs> I really do. But I remember the moment. Um, and it was a few years in that I woke up. It was early in the morning and, you know, very, um, the sun was coming through and I looked over and my husband was still sleeping and my you know, toddler was in the nursery just a few steps away and my other kids were downstairs and I went, I love my life. I am so happy. I am lucky to be here. And it was such an odd feeling. It was foreign to me to have that expansiveness, that happiness, that gratitude that, you know, I, it was, it was just crazy. And it, you know, it takes a lot of giving yourself permission to yeah. be who you are, to love yourself and to invite others into that. But the people that aren't going to be true supporters and cheerleaders, you just kind of, they just kind of, they don't get inner, they don't get VIP backstage access to your life anymore. Uh, that's a good note. Yeah, that's good. <laughs> I have to say that in that moment, you said, I love my life. What a beautiful moment for you that you were really experiencing self-love mm -hmm. at that moment. And but based on that work. a few uh, years prior, I, I get it. Like if someone had said that to me, I might've wanted to have slapped him in the face. Yes. No, I get that. I get that. So I, say, been putting the blank. Yeah. so I would say just start. I want to give um, listeners something very, very practical. You can start asking yourself, what did I make that mean about me? Hmm. Or, or, you know, something like an art or something that's happening today, you know, something your husband said or a friend said, or somebody said or did. And you're upset about it and you're mad at them. You know, we're talking about blame. What did I make that comment mean about me? And that is going to show you where your wound is, what your wound is. Well, I made it mean that I don't matter or I'm not important or I'm not likable or my opinions aren't welcomed here or I'm just, you know, it, what does it mean? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, I want to end on that very positive note. Um, the really good news is that there is someone as wonderful as Claire Unkefer who has gone through this personally. So really is speaking from that perspective and truly understands the process and has created communities and has created um, those steps, a pathway for you. All you have to do, and I don't mean to make this sound like it might be as simple as it's to decide. It's like anything else that we do. We get to choose. We get to decide. Commit to communicate. I think that is the key to just about everything. Commit to communicate, especially with the people who matter most to you in your life. I mean, why not? I mean, it's just kind of counterintuitive. Um, and I want to let people know how they can get in touch with you, Claire. I want to put something up right here that all you have to do is go right here. Click that, connect directly to Claire. 
go through the process, take the steps, decide that you're worth it, decide that the relationships in your life that must matter to you are worth it, or find out the path that is the most healthy for you. And I keep going back to that little boy because it is easier to pop drugs, I guess, take meds and think that that's a way. I love the positivity that you bring, Claire. I cannot thank you enough for the work that you do. First of all, you're a nurse. Um, nurses are, you know, angels on earth. So thank you for all you've done in your beautiful nursing uh, career and for the help that you make possible for so many people today. I, I truly, I thank you. I thank you so much. And I wish you nothing but, but continued success, happiness in your own life with your own four children, in your relationships, and in the work that you do to help others. Right, and for as many people as I can reach. Listen, if you reach one person, you change the life of one person, you change the world. I truly believe that. Yeah. And we pray for the ripple effect, that something that they've learned, you know, continues, that that energy just continues to go and flow until it hits another shore and then goes up there and does, does good work there as well. We know it's possible. You are amazing. Oh, thank you. <laughs> it has been so lovely to get to know you. And again, everybody, please just go here, connect with Claire, know that life can always be better, know that there's nothing wrong with you. You are lovable. You first have to learn to love yourself. That's right. Thank you for having me. A pleasure. As we always say um, on Vet Talks, you know, that may the best always be yet to come. We, we truly believe that. We truly want it. We believe it is possible. So until we talk again, may the best always be yet to come. Thanks for watching this edition. And thank you, Claire. Thank you. Bye for now.